Well, hello and welcome to the Autosport podcast for a special edition uh, covering the launch of Ferrari's new Formula One car, the SF1000. I'm your host, Alex Kalanorkas, and joining me today are James Allen, our own three times BAFTA winning F1 commentator, Autosport's technical editor, Jake Boxall Leg. We've got Ferrari's uh, former Ferrari race engineer, Roddy Basso. And joining us remotely, you'll hear him later on in the episode, is uh, motorsport.com F1 editor, Jonathan Noble. Uh, he's joining us remotely from Paris because that's where he's uh, ready and waiting for the new Renault 29, uh, 2020 rather car to be launched tomorrow. So let's start with the reason why we're all here. Jake, Roddy, what did you make of the SF1000 that's been uh, launched? What, what are we seeing from a technical point of view? Well, it was, uh, first of all, there was a lot of fanfare and eventually the car was rolled out. And I remember distinctly exclaiming as soon as it appeared that it looked relatively similar to the 2019 car. But once you delve into it, once you get more into the details, it's very much changed. They're trying to keep the same ethos of this low drag, uh, high speed car that served them very, very well in circuits like Belgium and Italy. But there are quite a few changes. Um, there's you know a change quite a considerable change to the barge boards for example um we can see uh, a great amount of detail uh continuing with the sort of development that's been going on over the season of 2019 uh there's a, a couple of horns as well around the airbox which is uh which i'm sure we'll delve into in a bit um they've kept kind of the same kind of front wing design uh as last year so whether that's a placeholder for something that we'll see in the future um we'll, we'll see when we come to testing teams usually like to hold a bit back at launches but it's a very very interesting car it looks a lot tighter it looks a lot meaner and they really mean business with it uh yeah agreed and um i also noticed this, the details on uh, on the ducts uh, the engine ducts with uh, uh, some wings like uh, red bull style especially in the second half of the season um, so of course they've been uh, looking around. I mean uh, they didn't make a secret that uh, they need to look at benchmarks and reference in order to uh, improve their performance in some uh, areas in some uh, race tracks. Um, I they kept the same phil philosophy on the front wing, which is different compared to Mercedes and Red Bull. Um, and uh, I I particularly noticed the the barge board, which are very very complex. So. Uh, in the past, I remember uh, I uh, work on cars with very difficult and uh, complex aerodynamics, uh, and it's a bit of a digital binary thing. So it can really work nicely, or it can be very difficult uh, to d manage the flow around that area. So let's see how we will uh, it will do. Mm. Now, Roddy, you were at Ferrari during the the ultra successful years at the start of the century with Michael Schumacher and specifically Rubens Barrichello. You were his race engineer during that time. But what's what's this stage of the season like for both a driver and engineer? What what was going through your mind at similar launch events back in the day? Well, of course, a lot of excitement. I mean, drivers, of course, start getting uh, dangerous on. Uh, on uh, on the roads on because they want to start pushing and so it's better that to keep them uh, on the racetrack they're ready to go and uh, and test and see how the new baby performs so and uh, likewise for the engineers uh, in particular race engineering group is uh, a bit kept apart during the final stage of the development because that's where the design office is all focused on uh, uh, delivering together with production and it's always very, very tight till the t till the end. So one of the reasons why sometimes they're not ready for the launch with all the parties, some strategic element, there is some strategic element, but sometimes there is also a matter of being late and being last minute at the racetrack, like it happened uh, also uh, during the test last year with Mercedes. They were ready only in the second week of, of Barcelona, uh, giving some hopes to many teams, but then they change the destiny and back to the past. So, as I said, very there's a lot of excitement, but of course the final answer is uh, not even the test, but more Australia with a checkered flag. Indeed. Now, Jake, you pointed out those horns you got quite excited about earlier. What did you guys, What can you tell us specifically what Ferrari might be trying to do by adding those onto the SF1000? Well, first of all, it's sort of quite an interesting area of the car because you see quite a lot of different air intake designs and over the last few years, it's kind of taken on a bit of a different role. It used to be purely for intake, but you have other parts to cool as well. Um, and also teams have sort of tried to divert some of the radiators away from the side pods to tighten that up and put them above the, you know, the, the intake uh, in the engine cover. But Ferrari kind of haven't done that. They persist with keeping the radiators within the side pods mainly so they can keep the, the air intake a lot sort of 
cleaner and a lot, lot narrower and improve the flow to the rear wing. Um, and by adding those horns, they sort of have a little bit of a box to play with. Um, and it's something that we've seen in the past. Uh, McLarens and BMWs of the past have had these kinds of horns and Ferraris are a lot smaller. But it does seem to be when you have the halo, you kind of do experience a little bit of disturbance in the airflow and that kind of seems to be an attempt to kind of tidy that up. And then by the time the airflow goes to the rear of the car, it's it's cleaner. Um, you don't have quite as much turbulence and then you're not sort of floundering around trying to get as much downforce back because you've got all of this turbulent air messing things up. Anything to add on the horns, Roddy? Um, well, I think he covered very well. I mean, that's the, the general aim. Of course, there is an element also of uh, uh, down so downforce itself. So I really haven't checked the angle of attack of the of the horns so we need to see there could be a small element of of uh, um, downforce together with also the behavior on the lateral side which is a bit like the fin of the engine cover so trying to uh, build up the the grip uh, more quickly but given the surface i think there should be a, a negligible uh, effect so it's more to clean the flow on the engine cover and the rear wing now we know that with the rule changes, well, with the rules remaining stable for this year, there are all the big changes are coming for next year. We're expecting that most designs will be evolutions of what we saw last season. So, what do you think Ferrari was was trying to fix and improve with this design? And do you think there's more to come in testing that we'll see that car taking steps forward just from what we've seen today? Well, uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, for sure Ferrari has got some uh, performance to recover in uh, some specific racetrack where you need uh, downforce. They are uh, not the very fast track, but where you know they uh, still have to manage to produce the same amount of downforce as Mercedes and Red Bull uh, do, uh, but in an efficient way. So uh, for sure they will concentrate, and this is I'm very curious to see if the front wing will stay as uh, as it is in terms of philosophy, because they need to concentrate on how the flow goes and how they can uh, rebalance the downforce uh, between the front wing and the rear wing uh, to add the track. Um, so that's the key element for them to to improve, and we will see um, how they will do. I think when you consider the team's performance at Singapore as well, um, they brought all of these updates and it, w it did end up being a little bit of an outlier in many respects, but all of the changes they brought to the front end it just seemed to be so much easier to roll into the corners. It seemed to be able to deal a little bit more easily with you know the cu quite heavy curbing that you see at Singapore. And Ferrari needs to be able to capture that essence and bring it to all of the circuits because when they turned up in pre-season testing last year, we were very effusive that the car looked good. But then by the time Melbourne came around, the, exp the, the weaknesses were quite exposed. Um, and so, yeah, Ferrari needs to widen its kind of performance window, not just be restricted to Belgium and Italy. It needs to be able to work in places like Monaco and Hungary and Singapore on a regular basis as well. Now, Jake, I'm not going to keep you too much longer because as Autosport's technical editor, you, you wear many hats. I know you're working on a, a feature that's going to go up tonight on Autosport Plus. Um, just finally, for, for both of you, do you think we, we've seen any, and I appreciate we haven't seen many of the new 2020 designs, but any cues that we might look out for later in the, the launches coming this week? For example, I know that some teams were looking at the Ferrari front wing towards the end of last season. Perhaps that's an area where they will have expanded upon. Yeah, I think we saw a lot of teams trialing it in practice in the US and Brazil and I think that will continue. I think it sort of seems to be a design that people have responded well to. Um, Ferrari have also come in with these big barge board boomerangs that we sort of saw become a trend last year and that will only increase. We'll only see the barge boards become more complex before 2021 and they're completely cold. Yeah, well, uh, in this phase of the season, um, sometimes I'm very curious to, to see if, uh, you know, there is some teams maybe, uh, let's say, taking inspiration from some other teams, but then these other teams changes philosophy and doesn't apply the same, you know, fence, uh, fins and, uh, and all the aerodynamic appendices. Uh, so it would be good to see if, uh, if there is a, a, a different approach uh, for example, with Red Bull and the wings on the duct, uh, if they keep them or if they get rid of them, then they will uh, generate some anxiety in the, in the red team. Mm. Well, we won't have long to wait. Red Bull are revealing their, their new car tomorrow morning. So, Jake, 
thank you very much for joining us. We'll, uh, we'll let you get on and hard at it with your laptop, making sure we've got that feature of Autosport Plus. So thank you very much. Now, James, turning to you, um, what did you make of that launch event? As we said, it was quite theatrical. We had lots of dance, lots of discussion about Italy, and it was certainly a very, a very grand event. Uh, a sign of intent for Ferrari, or is that reading a bit too much into it at this stage? I think it said a lot of things. I mean, obviously, those big, spectacular launches have a little bit gone out of fashion. You know, the, the high point was obviously the Spice Girls McLaren launch back in the in the late 90s. And so it tends to be sort of a more low-key event. This was very deliberately theatrical. It was very Italian. There was a lot of references to the Italian flag. There was a lot of pride there. And I think what you're seeing here is is Ferrari, and particularly Louis Camilleri, the, the CEO, who's now you know got his feet well and truly under the table, having great success on, in the road car side and the GTs selling those. This is him really putting the emphasis and the accent on the people. He made a big, big fuss of Ferrari's people. He talked about how they have an unparalleled work ethic. He, he got 70 or so people who've served the company, the, the race team, for over 35 years each to stand up and, and receive applause from everybody in this wonderful theater in Reggio Emilia. And that just says everything you need to know about the fact that Camilleri recognizes, and I've talked to him about this, I spent time with him towards the end of last year, he recognizes that to win as a Formula One team, you need to put your people first. And what they don't want is the culture that Ferrari had at various different times in the past, where if you made a mistake, you got your, your head cut off. You know, it's blame the problem, not the person. All the things that Toto Wolff has brought to his management philosophy at Mercedes and that stability and that tranquility that exists within the team, protected by the boss, which is what Roddy would know better than anybody. They had under Jean Todd back in the day when he was working there with Michael and Rubens and Ross Braun. It's bringing that serenity, that tranquility back so that the brilliant engineers can do their work, the drivers can do the business on the track, and for me, that was the loudest message of all about today's launch. Do you think, do you think it would be uh, too much of a stretch to also say, look, Sebastian, Charles, we can't have what happened in Brazil last year where they, they collided and both retired from the race because look at what, what all these thousands of people are working hard towards together because it's going to be a big question going into the year. Can these two guys get along and, and, and ideally for Ferrari deliver the results that they want? I mean, Sebastian was on his best behaviour Leclerc looked like the star on the stage, didn't he? Sebastian's won 53 Grand Prix and four world championships, but Leclerc's hair looked better. He just had that sort of swagger about him. And Vettel's got a real job on his hands to keep a lid on that guy this year. All the sort of sort of wisdom and the people second-guessing what's going to happen is that Leclerc is their man for the future, and, and this might be Vettel's last year at Ferrari, certainly if he doesn't perform in the first sort of six, seven months of the season. Who knows? I mean, it, anything could happen. There's lots of different directions that, that this could go in. Certainly, there have been some difficult times between, between Vettel and Ferrari, and certainly he's made a lot of mistakes in the last few years, which you just can't have from a, from a lead driver who's being paid many times more than, than, than Leclerc is. So... The elephant in the room was obviously the dynamic between the two drivers. Yes, of course, um, you don't want to let down all the employees, but you know it's a people business. Camilleri believes in believes in Vettel, but there's no question that he wants him to deliver. And I would say that the person under the most pressure in that room was was definitely Vettel. Mm. Now, Roddy, uh, as we sort of spoke about earlier, you were there during during those early dominant years in the early 2000s. What do you think Ferrari needs to do to, to recapture that glory? Because it's, it's getting on for quite a while. We know it's 20 years since Michael Schumacher's first title with the team. Yeah. So, first of all, we touched a very important point, which works in, in motorsport, but not only. Actually, it works in every in every company. How much is important to motivate people and to keep them, uh, I'm not going to say happy, because those times were not easy at all. We were working anyway under an incredible amount of pressure, and uh, let me say that comp since I've been working in other teams, compared to other teams, you somehow feel also the pressure of the nation because uh, people are in Italy are literally crazy about Ferrari. It's really something. Um, so this is a very important element, uh, keeping the focus and the pressure, but in the meantime, building the concept of a family. Jean Todt was very good in keeping the team together. And uh, since, of course, I met Jean, uh, Mr. Todd, uh, also in other, uh, when I was working for other companies and uh, in his uh, role in FIA, and not only, uh, I, thi I think he's bringing these uh, characteristics of this leadership characteristics also everywhere he goes. So that's incredibly important. Then 
Another important uh, challenge, which uh, let me add, uh, James, that another person under pressure is Binotto. He has been mentioned by Camilleri, and uh, of course with an element of trust, because that's what you want to do in the beginning of the season. But in the meantime, uh, I know Mattia very well. We were in the track together in those days. He's an incredible person. I know as a as a manager, as a people manager, he's one of the few good people manager with a, a uh, the right level of understanding on the technical side, but especially understanding of the people and the team. Um, so incredibly do good in the internal management. Nobody will ever complain under his management. Uh, we need to test and see uh, Mattia on the external management because, of course, when you run a race team, the strategy and the politics and the connection with FIA, even with Liberty and everyone, is very important. So maybe after a settled in in the in his position internally now he has to maybe focus a bit more f externally i think is another important uh, role i have to say last year there have been a few glitches in the operation at the track by ferrari i know many of those guys they are brilliant guy so maybe we could go back to point one you know empower people with without too much pressure or blaming culture um, in order to improve um, uh, how they operated the track. So maybe I would like to to you know to keep these three elements uh, as the most important and challenging for this year. Mm. And is is twenty twenty a particularly important year for Ferrari to prove that it can win without the major rules reset coming in twenty twenty one to defeat Mercedes in the first sort of. Uh, admittedly, it might be the second phase of the turbo hybrid era after the new cars came in in 2017. So do you think they need to show that they can step up without having to have that massive rules reset for next year? Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, if you're Ferrari, you're expected to win and you're expected to challenge at the front. Mercedes have, have, have kept there for, for six consecutive seasons. It's it's an unbelievable record. It's No one's ever done before what that team has done. And they set their intent at the beginning of every year. And last year they had a very clear goal. But, you know, inevitably, sooner or later, someone is going to beat them. Um, Red Bull obviously will will be thinking that, that this could be their year. You know, they need Honda to, to have stepped up. But there were plenty of signs from the back end of last season that that, that whole setup was getting getting stronger as well. So I think it's going to be I think it's going to be quite a quite a challenging season. But I think what's very interesting with Camilleri, and we saw a little bit of it as well yesterday from Wolf and, and Mercedes with that Ineos deal for five more years, is there's a, the, they're looking down the track. There's a forward-looking side to this, you know, where Ferrari are, are into Formula One. They're committed, and and they've got their you know their guys for the they've got their guy for the future in, in Leclerc, and you know you get that feeling that there's a solidity about Ferrari that's perhaps not been there in in recent times. So I'd be surprised if they don't step up this year. Now, John, coming to you, um, what can you tell us about Ferrari's mindset approaching the new season? I know you spoke to Matteo Bonotto recently. Um, do you think they've learned enough from last year to avoid the troubles that they faced in 2019 with all that tension between Vettel and Leclerc? Yeah, I think Matteo's a realist. I mean, he's, he says time and again, this is a young team. I know Ferrari have you know, been around. The, the thousandth Grand Prix for them is coming up, which is why the, the car's called the SF1000. But under Mattia, he, he was instrumental in changing the, the technical department, um, making it work much better, new, new structures, new processes, and that, that lifted it up in recent years. The team principal, he's, he's empowering engineers, working process, and there is no silver bullet to this. This is about producing you know, a car, and the car's all the, um, the result of lots of tiny different elements that, that make up it. So it was interesting hearing him talking about a push to extremes of this car to, to try and overcome some of the weaknesses. Um, you know, they're chasing more downforce. They change the suspension concept so it can be more flexible at different tracks. So Mattia knows that, you know, no matter what his management philosophy, no matter what he, how he deals with drivers, ultimately, if they're going to win, they need the fastest car. Indeed. And John, what I was going to ask you about that comment, that extreme, the extremes that they've gone to, do you think that could be something that come, could come back to bite Ferrari? Or was it a case of, look, we've understood what we didn't do so well last year and this is how we've addressed it with the SF1000? I think they understand what went wrong last year. Their, their concept was was low drag, the efficiency. They thought that was the best route to go for with the, the new front wings, and, and it you know allied to the steps they made with the engine. You know, it certainly worked. Look at Spa, look at Monza. Um, they were unbeatable, um, but they lost out uh, by downforce tracks. Look at Hungary when they were so far behind. Singapore, they started getting it together, and towards the end of the year, experimenting with more higher downforce solutions. 
which closed the gap up to the other teams and stages and red balling in corners. So that's what they're looking at doing is, is, is chipping away and trying, trying to find a car that's good at 21 or 22 races. Whatever number we're just being very, very quick, eight or nine. Indeed. And John, finally, as we said, you're in Paris ahead of the launch of the new Renault. Uh, what are you expecting from that event and what do you think we'll see from, from, the, from the French manufacturer? Well, we, we are actually going to see the car um, tomorrow. We've been promised some tea images, so any rather than the car launch. But I think what, what will be more interesting is actually to hear what the Cyril Abitable, the, the team principal says, and what Daniel Richard said up there, winter. You know, it was a big roller coaster season for them last year. A few highs, too many lows dramas, controversies. Um, they've got Esteban Ocon coming in. Life on Future had been questioned as well as when they had a, a big management shake-up at the, the road car company. It's going to be interesting to see how that, the last few weeks have gone for them. Have they understood what went wrong with last year's car and how are they going to make that step from being best of the rest, trying to close up to those top three teams? Indeed. Well, thank you, John. And thank you, Roddy. And thank you, James. And thank you to you for joining us on this episode of the Autosport Podcast. Uh, do join us tomorrow for another special episode, which, as we said, we'll, uh, we'll be looking at the new Renault as well as Red Bull's new 2020 machine, which will be revealed tomorrow morning.